And actually today, Ruth, is a special day um, while I'm talking to you because it's my, the post about mentoring, which I'm now giving away, is the 20th post of the 39 Ideas for Life project. So this means that um, we've passed the halfway point now, actually. With wow. The topic. So actually today I'm talking to Ruth um, Gotian to learn about mentoring. Uh, Ruth has a weekly show called Optimizing Success and is the driving force, or at least one of the driving forces behind the Mentor Project and the podcast with the same name, which aims to promote free science, technology and engineering and mathematics, mathematics educations worldwide. What's also exciting, and I'm really curious about this, by the way, so maybe we have to talk again, because you're also the author of The Success Factor, Developing the Mindset and Skill Set for Peak Business Performance, which is coming out next month on January 25th, if I'm correct. That's correct, yes. She is also the former Assistant Dean of Mentoring and Executive Director of the Mentoring Academy at Will Cornell Medicine, where she's currently the Chief Learning Officer and Assistant Professor of Education in Anesthesiology. Ruth, thank you so much for being with me on this morning, my afternoon. I'm excited to Thanks talk to you and I'm happy me. that we could, we could make the call happen, yeah. I am so excited, so excited to geek out with you. Awesome. Hey, let me kick off by um, somewhat of a personal question because I'd love to hear your personal story because I've looked at your track record and your career path and you've done so much in this realm of mentoring. So I'm really curious to hear what is your story? What got you so involved in capturing by this, yeah, by, by mentoring? What happened? Well, it, it's really, it, it's a backstory of how I got interested in studying success and especially extreme success. Yeah. I was running a program called an MD PhD program. My students would get the dual degrees, both the MD and the PhD simultaneously in mm -hmm. seven to eight years. This program had a three and a half percent acceptance rate. Mm. It, it's really the best of the best who got in. And certain people would float to the top. But this program really wasn't for everyone because it's hard, right? It's a seven to eight year sprint. Yeah. And a lot of people would leave what something we call the leaky pipeline. So we, we always had an issue of retainment and everyone was looking at the end of the spectrum of those who were leaving mm -hmm. where I was more interested in those who were far out, far out succeeding everyone else. And I said, wow. those are the ones we need to look at. Those yeah. are the ones we need to replicate. That's a good approach. And right. And um, I actually I went while working full time, I went back to school to get my doctorate to study this. This is how obsessed with success I became. Wow. And one of the things that they all had in common, and we can talk about four elements, but one of them is that they all had not just one mentor, they had a team of mentors around them. Mm, I have a question about this later. That's yes. Yeah. And it became so apparent to me that and then I, you know, I really started looking into it. Those who are mentored out earn and outperform those who are not. They mm. also have lower burnout, greater loyalty to the organization. They publish more if they're academics. They have greater satisfaction both in their jobs and their careers. So I really need someone to prove to me why everyone should not have a team of mentors around them because all the research is pointing to the fact that this, that this is what can get you to the top of the pack. Huh. That's so interesting because actually one of, one of my questions uh, was, should we have just one mentor or should we seek out different mentors? If so, why? So, so let's yeah. touch upon that. You, you, you talk about a, a group or, or like a, a, yeah, like a, a team, a team of mentors, a team of mentors. And yeah, I, I, this issue is so important that in the book, the success factor, I actually devoted three chapters to it because oh. it's that critical. So back in the day, we used to think that you should have one mentor who, one mentor who's older, wiser, more senior to you. Yeah. But that's actually very limiting because what if that person leaves the organization? Yeah. Then what? You're stuck with nothing. Yeah. So we need to find a better way. And what happens is when I ask people if you have a mentor, they always say to me, well, I'm, I'm looking for the perfect person. But mm -hmm. guess what? Perfect person doesn't exist. You're not perfect. I'm not perfect. Exactly. Yeah. 
but you can create your own version of perfect yeah. where you take the best parts of different people and get them to be your mentors. Yeah. So for example, when I wrote the book proposal for the success factor, yeah. I actually showed it to one of my mentors who wrote multiple books so that she could give me amazing feedback. Yeah. I did not give it to my mentor who's a lawyer who's never written a book in his life. Yeah. That would not have been helpful. Right. So you really need to make sure that you get the right people. When I negotiate something, who do you think I'm going to? The lawyer who negotiates all day long. Yeah. But you really need to find the right people to have in your camp to really help you. And you know, you need to know who to call on. Now, there's actually three layers of mentors that you need. You still need the people who are senior to you because they mm -hmm. can teach you things and um, they, they know the politics, They've, they'll save you a lot of time. You also want people who are at your level. Mm -hmm. So the people who are at your level, what we call peer mentors, because mm -hmm. remember peers rise together. You're not going to be a junior person forever. Yeah. In the book, The Success Factor, I share that the president of Simmons University in Boston and the Dean of Wharton, the number one business school in the world are best friends. Mm but they met as graduate students in their twenties huh. yeah. and they just stayed very close and mentor each other as peer mentors over the decades. Yeah. And then of course you also want people who are junior to you because they might know things and how to do things that you are not aware of. Yeah. And those are some of the things that to consider. So they might understand technology. They might understand the social media platforms. I tell yeah. the faculty members, I said, you're too busy to read the entire articles. You're probably just skimming the abstracts. I said, but the junior students, they're reading the entire articles. Yeah. You want to find out what's important to them, what they're seeing. So that's what's important. That's yeah. how to do it. I think you mentioned there's, there's four layers. So what, yeah. is, what is the fourth one? So there's actually four elements of success. Okay. So the first one, and this is from all my interviews with astronauts and Nobel Prize winners and Olympic champions and all these people. So the first one is you would do it for free if you could. You mm. are intrinsically motivated to do it. Yeah. This is different from extrinsic motivation. Yeah. Extrinsic is you're doing it for the promotion. You're doing it for the money. You're doing yeah. it for the diploma, the recognition. That's yeah. extrinsic motivation. Yeah. Those people fail out or burn out. Yeah. Intrinsic motivation, there's a fire within you. Yeah. And they keep going so, at night, it doesn't matter. Exactly. Yeah. It's the reason they wake up in the morning. It's a reason they have a hard time shutting their brain off at night. Yeah. So for example, if God forbid, somebody in your family was sick and died from cancer, you don't want anyone to ever have to go through that. And you decide to dedicate your life to finding a treatment. Mm -hmm. to this disease that has impacted millions upon millions of people. Yeah. Now, it doesn't matter if you're faced with the challenge of your grant was rejected, the experiment didn't work, the paper you know, wasn't accepted. You're not going to quit because mm -hmm. you don't want anybody else to suffer from this. You are intrinsically motivated. And that leads perfectly to number two your level of perseverance, resilience, tenacity, grit, whatever word you want to use. Mm -hmm. Because when you've got that fire burning within you, you are going to outwork everybody because you know that every day you're wasting, another person is going to suffer from cancer. Mm -hmm. You know that. But it doesn't mean working 16, 18 hour days. That's not what outwork everyone means. Outwork everyone means is that you are laser focused during your work hours. You understand what your cognitive hours are when you are super focused. And that is when you are going to do your deep thinking. You're not going to do your deep thinking in the afternoon or evening when you're tired or tired or slushier or foggier in your, in your thinking, you are going to maximize those hours when you're freshest. And for me, those are the morning hours. I'm a morning person. That's usually when I do a lot of my writing. Mm -hmm. Now, the third one is a strong foundation, which you're constantly reinforcing the same thing you did early in your career. You're going to do later in your career. So 
back to our scientists, for example, you will, I've never ever heard of a scientist who quit doing science just because they won the Nobel prize. Doesn't happen. But what they did early in their career, they do later in their career. Every year we see pictures of people who won the Nobel and the same day that they won the Nobel, they're still submitting grant applications. They're still getting in front of a classroom and teaching yeah. things that they did early, they're doing later. It's yeah. the same thing with the NBA and Olympic athletes who I interviewed, Yeah. right? The drills that you see the NBA and the Olympic stars doing, you would see the same thing in any seventh grade gym. The NBA players and Olympians just have better sneakers. It's the same exact drills. Yeah. Now, last but not least, the fourth one, just because you've won all of these medals and awards and got all this recognition, you don't stop learning. Yeah. You just don't. Now, you can't sit in a classroom. That's really not, it doesn't really work with the lives of adults to sit in a classroom for six to eight hours a day, but we can learn in other ways right? So maybe you read books, maybe you read articles, maybe you uh, read blogs, maybe you listen to podcasts. Hopefully I'm sharing some great information here, maybe on YouTube, um, maybe on social media, maybe on Clubhouse, maybe LinkedIn Learning. You see what I'm saying? There's yeah. so many ways that you can learn new things. Yeah. And one of those ways, in addition to all those things I just mentioned, is you learn from your mentors. And that's what all the extreme high achievers had. They had a team of mentors. Yeah. And that's, that's where we are. And those are the four. Yeah, interesting. So let me ask you a practical question. Um, actually, these are a couple of questions interlinked. Mm -hmm. Because I've actually had a um, mentor relationship. I've developed mentor relationships with the people that I've been, been in business with. Yeah, I've started a number of companies and I've always, or not always, but majority of companies I've started with a, a partner who has been way senior in age and experience than me. And that led to kind of also, apart from having a business relationship, also to there be a mentoring relationship developing. Great. And these have not been formal mentor-mentee relationships where we said, okay, you're my mentor or whatever. Like it's, it's been not that, like that, but that, that was the a part of the relationship. Yeah. And it kind of, there wasn't a formal practice or a formal, okay, we have meetings and it was, it's almost daily, you know, that, that there's all kinds of exchange on, on topics, whatever comes up business wise, but also just life or personal, it, 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 it there's just the experience that I can tap into. Yeah. Um, and these have been people that I've built long lasting relationships with, and I'm still having these relationships. So they're still part of my, my network of mentors, so to speak. But here's the thing, um, there are certain, certain areas or certain fields that we might want to venture into, which are not uh, our own or we're not familiar with. How do we connect with people that we, we don't really have that resonance or because there's no personal relationship? Yep. How yep. can we connect with someone based on this mentor relationship? Um, and how can we make sure that it's interesting for them also? And, and you know, because people are busy. I know I'm busy. Everyone is yep. busy nowadays. Yeah. So how do we trigger someone to say, okay, you know, this is interesting. And so these are a number of questions in one, but I, I hope you're so, pointing. First of all, you hit the nail on the head. You actually did the right thing. Um, when people tell me that mentors need to be assigned, I said, assigned based on what? Yeah. Based on you're both from the same hometown. Well, I happen to know that not everyone in the Netherlands or not everyone in Amsterdam is the same. So why putting two people from Amsterdam together based on that, it's just, it's completely random. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't like when people do those matches. I don't think it needs to be formal mm -hmm. because I think it's, it's like dating. The best ones are organic. They're not forced, right? Yeah. Now, the other thing you would never ask somebody to be be your friend, right? I, I would never say, you know, will you be my friend? You don't yeah. say that. Yeah, so why point. would you ask someone to be your mentor? Yeah. Because the second you ask someone to be your mentor, you're asking them to take on another obligation and yeah. nobody has time for that. Huh. But okay. instead you ask them for their perspective, their ideas. Can I get your thoughts on something? Yeah. Because everybody's willing to give their thoughts on something, yeah. especially if they have expertise on it, right? 
you have your blinders on, you need another perspective, say, mm-hmm. look, I am so deep inside the jar. I can't read the label. I just need a fresh perspective. I, would you mind just hearing me out on this? Yeah. That's better than, will you mentor me on how to continue with this project? Yeah. Right. Exactly. That sounds like I need to carve out time in my calendar and I'm sorry, I don't have any to give you. Right. Yeah. A perspective I can give you. Yeah, that's a great point, actually, because also the, the latter example you'd give, we kind of put our responsibility of doing the work in somebody else's uh, in somebody else's lap, which right. is also not a good feeling for that person to to receive such a request. That's but right. indeed, if you ask for perspective or if you ask for this has actually been, been my experience. Um, and maybe this is something I, I've learned by experience. For, for two of my masters, I, I researched vision implementation success. I've been fascinated by it. And I've done a lot of interviews with, with um, for my qualitative uh, research, a lot of interviews with CEOs and really big companies about this process. And they all made time, to my surprise, to talk to a student who there yeah. was really no value for me apart from the exchange to them, but they all made time an hour and some of it um, led to three or four hour conversations. And, and this is actually what, your first point, you said people would do it if they if they if they could do it for free. You know, they would still yeah. do it. That's right. And these people, they love what they do, so they love to share and they love to to, to share their perspective. Yeah. So I think this is this is already the golden nugget maybe of this interview so far to ask people for yeah you know, for their perspective. And by that we can build a relationship and we can yeah. We can and and I'm and I'm going to build on what you said because I had the same Please. thing when I got my doctorate, I looked at the most successful physician scientists of our generation. That, that's how my research on success started. And I looked at people who won the biggest awards in the sciences, the breakthrough, the Lasker, Nobel Prize winners, a former Surgeon General, NIH Institute directors. And they all gave me time. Yeah. They all gave, I was a grad student. They yeah. all gave me time. Some of them gave me, as you said, a lot of time, exactly. a lot of time. Yeah. One of, one of, one of the people, it had to be rescheduled. I'll never forget this three times because this person had to testify before Congress about huh. whatever it was. Yeah. And finally I said to his assistant, I said, is he actually going to talk to me? And she said, oh, no, no, no. He is very interested in talking to you. We this just have to. Yeah. This is, yeah. So, um, yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it worked out. Actually, one of the people that I interviewed for my master research, he became the business partner in my first company. And that, wow. was, also, and that was also someone who actually I traveled all the way to the other end of the country at that time for a half an hour interview. I was traveling for eight hours for half an hour, but that actually resulted in us talking for, I don't know how many hours already when there was initially only half an hour available. Yeah. Yeah. That happens a lot. That happens a lot. You know why? Because people like to talk and people like to help people who they know, like, and trust. So what are you doing to get people to know, like, and trust you? Yeah. Because at the end of the day, you want to help them, I hope, right? Hopefully you're giving more than you're taking. Yeah. And you're going to help people that you know, like, and trust. Yes. You don't want mentoring to be transactional. I'll help you, then you'll help me. Exactly. That's not how it works. Yeah. You help because you want to. Yeah. You want to make this world a little bit better than you found it. Yeah. And everybody has some special skill. If I can help a Nobel Prize winner with the marketing of his book, then certainly everyone else can help someone else. This guy yeah. is smarter and more successful than I will ever be. Yeah. But he knows science and he doesn't quite know the marketing around a book. Yeah, people and have their his focus. entire network is scientists and he's trying to reach out to other networks. And if I can show him how to do that, And that's why I'm saying everyone, no matter how junior you are, there is something that you can offer someone and don't be shy about those things that you can offer. Even if it's to create a nice graphic for a social media post, what may, what might take you 60 seconds could take them half a day. And it would be so amazing if that is something that you can just really help them with and teach them how to do it or do it for them. Yeah, that's also a great point. I actually wanted to ask about the pay it forward part of this whole exchange because it's not the transactional exchange, as you said, and it's where we 
and basically ask for people's perspective, which obviously helps us on our path. Yeah. And and so can you can you share more about this element of paying it forward? I guess there's part of that in also having because that's what you said with the mentoring. You have a senior, you have someone who's at your level, and you have someone who's below your level yeah. in terms of experience. Yeah. Yep. Um, yep. Please share more about the paying it forward element of this process. Yeah. So Dr. Debbie Heiser, who's the C the co-founder and CEO of the Mentor mm -hmm. Project. There's a fabulous TED talk about this, and she's an aging specialist, a psychologist, and she talks about the theory of generativity, which means the older people get, the more they wish to give back. Mm. But the challenge has always been that just like the junior people who are looking for mentors, the senior people want to give back and they want to mentor, but they don't quite know how to approach people because mm. you can't just walk up to some random person and say, can I be your mentor? That's about as awkward as saying, will you be my mentor? So they're having the same problem. Hmm. And that's why Dr. Debbie Heiser, together with Bob Cousins, founded the nonprofit, The Mentor Project, where she now has up to 90 high achievers, including our mutual friend, Andy Lapata. Yeah who are mentors, who give back for free. Yeah. And there's other people, there's astronauts, there's astrophysicists, there's a yeah, lot I've of seen, people. I've seen the list, it's very impressive. It's, it's incredibly impressive. And yes. all of these people wish to give back in some way. Yeah. And what Dr. Debbie Heiser did was she created that medium where if the senior person wants to give back and there is a student who's looking for a mentor, she helps introduce them to people yeah. who could help them. Yeah. And there's, you, you're not ever stuck with that person. That doesn't work. You can go find another person. There's 90 of them. Yeah. So that is really, it's, it's, she found a solution to a problem people didn't even know existed. And there's yeah. all these senior people who really want to give back. And, uh, you know, senior means different things to different people. Sure. It yeah. really means you just have more experience than somebody else. Yeah. That's all. Yeah. Yeah. Fascinating, and, and, right? <laughs> sorry? It's fascinating, right? Once you once you see it, you can't unsee it. No, definitely. It, it, it's amazing. And what I was just thinking is it's actually just like like dating, just like interpersonal relationships on any level, actually. Because I hear you say about that, that, the, that, that the senior experience, they, they're looking for someone to mentor, but it's awkward to, to just say, hey, will you be my mentee or, you know? Right. And it's the same when we when we see someone we like or we have some interest, we, we, we typically hold back and we don't talk. And actually, I think what we could all benefit from is just to be more open and more engaging with one another, more interested in one another, because everyone has a story that is probably more fascinating than we can, can even begin to think. That's right. And yeah. I think it's a great point. That's right. <laughs> you've you've mentioned um, you've mentioned the part of asking for perspective. Yes. What other angle could you could you share that one could use by identifying or finding a mentor or a partner or sorry someone who who has a different some some, some of the mentoring role, but not only just the perspective. Maybe there's some, something else. Yeah. So, you know, the mentors can really help you think about things in a different way. They could introduce you to people in their network. They can teach you skills. They have the skills, the perspectives, the political capital, all of that. And the great mentors will use that to help mm -hmm. you move forward, to help yeah. you think bigger and see things beyond your horizon. And mm -hmm. they will also introduce you to people from your network, from their network. So, if you need, um, if you're working on a project, and for example, if you, I'm an academic, right? I'm a faculty member. And one of the things you need in order to get promoted in academia, you need a national or international reputation. That's how you get promoted. You don't get promoted for doing your job. You get a salary for that. Mm. You get promoted for having a national or international reputation. So how do you do that? Well, we publish, right? That's how we, that's, that helps, but also we get invited to give talks. So one of the things that you can do, if, for example, as an academic, you reach out to your mentor saying, I am working on this. 
I am looking to give three more talks this year because I'm beginning to work on my promotion packet. And I need people nationally. I, I have enough regionally. I'm looking for things nationally. Do you know anybody who would be interested in hearing my talk on this subject? Mm. And they'll say, oh, yes, I know so-and-so at the University of so-and-so. Let me go email her. Yeah. And that's how it happens. Yeah. Most people just wait for those invitations to come in instead of taking the initiative yeah. and leveraging their mentoring relationship to help. Now you take it a step further, all right? Now you have this invitation that your mentor set up for you. You want to make sure that you are making your mentor proud, which means you're doing your best work. Yeah. So you can say to your mentor, thank you so much for organizing this talk for me with so-and-so at the university of such and such. Can I go over my talk with you? You know this audience. I'm wondering if there's anything I'm not seeing, anything you think I should add, anything you think I'm going into too much detail about, uh -huh. right? Say, I find this fascinating and I can talk about it all day long, but I realize not everyone wants all of those details. Do you have maybe 20 minutes that we can, we can go over it? Yeah. And, and that's how it's done. That's I how it's done. I think you said something important here because I was going to say, well, isn't this over asking, you know, while you were speaking, I, I was, I was thinking instead of listening, which is a bad point on my part, but, um, and then you said, can I ask for 20 minutes of your time, which I think yeah. is the critical thing. You don't want to ask for a lot. You want to make it very easy for them to, yeah. to say yes to. Yeah, exactly. It's a great and point. just say, and if you don't have the time, I completely understand yes is there someone else who you think would be helpful for me to talk to here yeah. i want to make sure that i make you look good because you made this introduction for me ah it's another another important part yeah right because anytime your mentor is using their political or social yeah. capital yeah. to introduce you to someone to make a connection it is your responsibility to make them look good. Otherwise, you will never get another connection or invitation from them. Yeah. Yeah. You want to make them look good. Yeah, very good to point. Do whatever also, that takes. Also, to mention that kind of puts it in their interest to help you again. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. And you have to make them proud. And yeah. when you finish, whatever it is that they helped introduce you to, follow up. You follow up and give them a thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. Yeah, it actually, it's funny how I got to you because actually it's really interesting. I'll share it because it's it's actually somewhat like this because I had um, I talked to Carrie Phipps about talking to strangers. Yep. And uh, Carrie Phipps, she introduced me to Pravin Shakur from India. Mm -hmm. Pravin introduced me to Andy. Andy introduced me to you. You see. Yeah, so this, <laughs> you know, the, the fourth and everything is connected. It's so it's, interesting. It's always connected that way. And, um, I, you know, it's funny. I've yet to meet Andy in person. Um, and the way I met him uh, is through a mutual friend who endorsed his book. Yeah. And she announced it on her social media. Um, so I wrote to him, I said, congratulations on your new book. And then we got onto a Zoom, and from there, the rest is history. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's great. And I've and I've been I've been doing exactly as you said. As soon as I, I put a post live, I, I make sure that I also send the link to the person who introduced me because you yeah. know it's all part. They're they're part of actually that content and and the and the Absolutely. whole experience. Yeah. Absolutely. And it's 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 again a great example of people wanting to help one another and. Uh, and share their knowledge and experience. I think it's absolutely, awesome. yeah. absolutely. Look, most of the, I, I interviewed pretty amazing people for the book, The Success Factor. Yeah. Astronauts and Nobel Prize winners and Olympic champions and CEOs. All of them, almost all of them, 95% were through warm introductions from other yeah. people. Yeah. That's how I got, I don't, you know, I didn't grow up knowing astronauts and yeah. Olympians, yeah. right? Or Nobel Prize winners. Not a certain no neighborhood one. that you're in. Yeah. Right, but you know, Nobel Prize winners, I knew several because of where I worked. But once you know one 
and they go back to know, like, and trust, yeah. they will introduce you to others. And that's, that's how it, that's how it kept happening, yeah. um, is because I knew some and, um, you know, and they kept introducing me to others. And now I have astronauts and Nobel prize winners and Olympians who I now count, not just people who I studied for my research and for the book, the success factor, but I now count them as really good friends. That's awesome. Yeah. So it's. No and and it means they learn from you too. And there's, cause there's always an exchange. Yeah. Well, it's really great. Never thought of it that way, but no, yeah. of course. I mean, if, if you would be the only one who's taking in the relationship, I'm sure they wouldn't. They wouldn't. Continue. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I guess. Well, yeah. That's a big, big compliment. Yeah. I never yeah. thought of it that way. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I guess that goes back to that fourth element of continuous learning through informal means. Yeah. Yeah. You, no. you just, you just underscored my research. Thank you. Very welcome. Hey, I've read um, in a book on mentoring that I that I read in research for this topic. Typically, and I'm not sure where this data comes from, but it was in the book. Um, typically, a mentoring relationship lasts between 12 and 18 months. Um, in my experience, as I shared before, it's much longer. What are your thoughts yeah, on the duration I, of this relationship? I, I actually think it's a it's a lifetime relationship, but not a lifetime commitment. Yeah. So because you have a team of mentors, as you start advancing in your career, there's certain mentors that will be with you forever, yeah. but you don't call on them forever. So the mentors who really helped me out early in my career, professionally, they don't have the right guidance for the situations I'm dealing with right now. Yeah. But if I'm dealing with a sticky situation and I want to hear another perspective, just to weigh things out in my mind, I will still reach out to them. Mm -hmm. And they can also transition from mentor to friend. That's 100% okay. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's what really happens. Now, the reason I say it's not a lifetime commitment is, and this is especially with ones where they're assigned, which you already know I'm not in favor of. Yeah. When mentors are assigned, there has to be an exit ramp. There has to be a way that either the mentor or the mentee can say, this isn't working. Yeah. I'm out of here. Yeah. And that's why I'm saying it doesn't have to be a lifetime commitment because you have to give it a try three yeah. months, six months, a year, whatever it is, but there has to be a way that, that you can go out. But I am still in touch with mentors who I've had for 20 years, 25 yeah. years. Yeah. So I definitely think it's longer than 12 to 18 months. Yeah, I would, I would How often, say that too. I don't reach out to them very often, maybe yeah. once a quarter now, where there was yeah. times I would reach out to them weekly. Yeah. Um, and now it's more of a catch up. How yeah. are you? What's new? How's the family? Yeah. But every so often, they're still the people I want to talk to. Yeah. Yeah. And, and like any relationship, it's, it's, it's great to, to just keep in touch and to... Yeah. Yeah, to keep updated with what's what's happening for, for, for them and, uh, and for you. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Is there a certain um, mentor-mentee model kind of thing? Something that there's some core elements that should always be there as part of that relationship? And, and I think that, well, let me not say much more because I hear you. I see you nodding. So please. Sure. Well, look, I think mentors and mentees need to trust each other. Yeah. I need to trust that you have my best interest at heart and I will have yours. Yeah. I'm never going to make you look bad. Um, I'm always going to back you up. Um, it goes back to that no like and trust factor. Yeah. But I also want to know that when I reach out to you, and this is for mentor or mentee, when I reach out to you, you will get back to me within a reasonable time frame. Yeah, yeah. Um, and also, um, you you can't worry that I am going to start collaborating with other people. You can't be threatened by that. Yeah. A mentor should never be threatened by their mentee's success. They should celebrate it. Yeah. Yeah. They should absolutely celebrate it. So if you look at the Nobel Prize winner, Dr. Bob Lefkowitz, he has mentored over 200 people. 
And he said, their success is my success. Yeah. So much so that the Nobel prize he got, he shared it with one of his former mentees. Yeah. He shared the Nobel prize. Yeah. He was so excited by that. I, I read your you, article about this. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he, he was so excited by that. And, and you want somebody who will celebrate and be so excited by your success, yes. not be envious. And um, because there's some mentors who think if the, there's a light on you, it takes the light off of them. Yeah. That's not mentoring. That's no. jealousy. Yeah. Yeah, get far yeah. away from those people. Yeah. So you want people who will help you succeed and celebrate your success and believe in you more than you believe in yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Please share a bit more about the mentoring of the person with less experience than you. And, and maybe also in relation, because I think we always, even if you look at the dictionary, def the dictionary definition, it's like someone who is more senior, has more experience, yeah. yada, yada. The thing is, with, with someone who is at your level, peer mentoring, that's not the case. And if, with someone who has less experience than you or, or is younger of age, also not the case. So can you tell more about that relationship? Or those when, the young, when the younger person is mentoring the more yes. senior person? Yes. So I'll tell you what happened to me, uh, God, long, long time ago. Um, I was at a conference recruiting students back when we used to do in person and we would stand at a booth and there was 3000 people there. And I would say the same thing over and over and over again, one-on-one -on -one to people all day long for three days. Mm. And I'm hoping that at the end of the day, I don't sound like a robot. And I sound just excited as I did at the beginning of the day. Yeah. Well, I walked in to this conference, which I had been attending for years, but this time on an easel, there was a board and there was a picture of um, what I thought was a pound symbol, what we now call a hashtag. Mm -hmm. And it said the, the name of the conference. And I'm watching, these were all college students and I'm watching them. And everyone is talking about tweet, 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 tweet. And I have no idea why they're making these bird sounds. And everyone is looking down at their phone all day long. Yeah. And I'm in my booth, one-on-one, -on -one, talking to people. So finally, I pulled over a former student who's a generation younger than me. And I said, what, what is happening here? What is, what is this tweet, tweet, tweet? What, why is everyone staring at their phone? Why is everyone in a hurry? You know, what is happening? Yeah. And this must have been at least 10 years ago. He starts telling me about Twitter. First, I heard of it. And I remember I was in St. Louis, Missouri in the United States. That night, I went to my hotel room and I opened my first Twitter account. Mm. I didn't even have a picture. My, my image was an egg, right? Remember, you used to come with an egg. Yeah, yeah. And then I started opening and having this communication. And that's when I realized that the conversation I was having one-on-one -on -one with people, me reaching maximum a few hundred, was happening with thousands of people online and this whole new communication medium. Yeah. If, and th there were issues that they were afraid to talk about in person, but they were talking about openly on social media. Huh. Yeah. And I quickly realized that people were giving each other incorrect information and I was able to come in and share the correct information. Yeah. And all of a sudden I was able to influence in a positive way, thousands of people, not a few hundred thousands. And it was actually the student who was a generation younger than me, who actually taught me about this platform taught me about its impact, taught me about its influence, taught me about when to do it and how to do it and yeah. why to do it. And then it opened up. And that's why I'm so active on Twitter and LinkedIn and all these platforms, yeah. because I realize it's a whole separate conversation that's happening. Yeah. A conversation that some people are afraid to have in person, but they're having online. And that's why, that's why I have it. So that's how somebody who's a generation younger than me taught me how to use Twitter. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great example. 
So that so so I imagine that a lot of that that type of mentoring is for new technology or for things that we've kind of passed with our own active presence, but it's all of a sudden there. Well, it could be, but remember, um, I am now mentoring a Nobel Prize winner who has a book out. Mm -hmm. And um, we're talking about marketing his book outside the world of scientists because he has plenty of access to scientists. He wants to reach outside that. And I'm mentoring him on how to do that. Yeah. So, and we're not even talking about technology. We're talking about the no like and trust factor with people in other industries. Yeah. And he's using my social and political capital with people outside the scientific community because we have some overlap within that community. Yeah but I have it in other communities for him to be able to reach, reach a whole different network and it's working. And we've been, we've been talking about that. So just as much as I learned from him, I like to think that he's learning some marketing skills from me. I'm sure he is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because when I, when I started researching you, I can find you all over the place. It's very impressive. Definitely. <laughs> it was marketing was definitely my uh, favorite class in grad school. That's awesome. Well, it, it shows, I would say. Yeah, it shows. Yeah. Hey, um, I'd like to close. Actually, I'd like to close always with the same question, which is only one part of the question is different. But what question about mentoring did I not ask, which I should have asked? Because there's always must be some angle that I've completely overlooked, or and I'm sure there are many, but what, what important part about mentoring did I not touch it on? I think, how do you find a mentor in a pandemic? Huh. Yeah, where you can't physically meet. You can't physically meet. We're not always going to the office. We're not really going to conferences, et cetera. Well, I actually think this is a beautiful opportunity to find mentors. In fact, I wrote an article about it for Harvard Business Review. Mm -hmm. um, how do you find mentors when you're not leaving the house? Well. Remember I talked about the continuous informal learning, which is what all high achievers do. Yes. There has been in the pandemic, no shortage of webinars and LinkedIn lives and all of these things, many for free. And this has been a great opportunity to learn from some of the greats. Yeah. So one of the things that you can do is reach out to the speaker you can do it beforehand. I'm really excited to hear your conversation with blah, 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 yeah. or afterwards, right? This is where you use your LinkedIn learning, um, the messaging feature. Yeah. But don't ignore the people in the audience. And this is a lot, most people do. And this is why the audience is very important. They are all interested in the same topic. That's why yeah. they logged on. Yeah. So see in the comments who made, who made a, engagement, a comment, a statement that you agree with. Great point. Yeah. Or that opened your mind to something yeah. and reach out to them and say, I really, really liked your comment about such and such. It resonated with me because, and then you start a communication with them. Yeah. That's the way to do it. The other way to do it is um, if there are authors who you follow, authors of books, or authors of articles, you mentioned I write for Forbes and Psychology Today. If you like what they write, start connecting with them on social media. You will yeah. get the regular content to what it is that they write about and start engaging with it. Yeah. And trust me, trust me, they will, they will notice who is connecting in a positive way. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great and practical point. And it really expands our our awareness and our learning. And I really also like the point where you say, connect to the other people, your peers, again, That's right. who, who are um, yeah, saying interesting things in the comment section somewhere. Yeah, it's a really That's great right. Thing. That's right. You know, we recently had the um, Thinkers 50 Awards. These are the biggest management thinkers in the world. I want to tell you that the comment section was the most fascinating part all the lectures that they had in the fireside chats were fascinating. Really? They were absolutely fascinating. But who do you think was, was writing in the comment section? Other big management thinkers. Yeah. And then you get to connect with them. And all, a lot of these online conferences also, they have these breakout rooms for networking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Every society conference has it, yeah. right? I am appalled. I don't understand why people just don't show up. Yeah. So what happens is if you show up. Exactly. I was going to say that's already such a, you're such ahead of the game there. Exactly. Yeah. I've gotten to meet some of people I never would have been able to reach just by showing up. Yeah. And there were only 10 people there. Yeah. Thousands were at this conference, but 10 people showed up to the, to the networking session. Yeah. Why? Yeah. Why? So you get to meet other like-minded thinkers who clearly are there to connect. And I, I now got to reach out with people whose work I just so admire and respect. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Hey Ruth, thank you so much. It was really great. I've learned thank a lot. You. Yeah. Thank you really for having great. me. I really appreciate it. Awesome.